So welcome back to the Center for Healthcare Innovation's Patient Engagement Lunchtime Learning Series. Um, as always, I will start us off with a few housekeeping items. So we do have time for discussion at the end, but you're also welcome to comment in the chat at any time to the uh, host or co-hosts of the meeting. Uh, to use the chat box, you will click the chat button at the bottom of your screen and enter your text where it says type message here. And then please also note that if you have any trouble using Zoom at any time, you can directly message me and I will try to assist you. And also please note that the, for the lecture portion of this session, participants will be permanently muted and video is turned off. And we will re-enable this feature during the question period once the recording ends. We also have auto transcription enabled, so you should see closed captioning for this session. If you want to toggle this off or on at any time, you can do so by using the caption button at the bottom of your screen. The session is accredited by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada as a group learning activity and may also be eligible for credits towards requirements of other professional bodies, such as the College of Pharmacists of Manitoba and the College of Registered Nurses of Manitoba. We will also be sharing a link of the recording on our YouTube page and slides with everyone who has registered. Now I would like to welcome and introduce our speakers for this session, Carolyn Shimon, Dr. Amy Fryer, and myself. We will first hear from Carolyn, who is the Patient and Public Engagement Lead at the Georgian Fay Center for Healthcare Innovation, which is Manitoba's Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research, or SPORE, support unit. In this role, she is responsible for all patient and public engagement in health research programs and services offered at our center. I too am with the CHI group and I am the special programs coordinator. Among other programs, I coordinate our preparing for research by engaging patient and public partners award and you will hear about this closer to the end. And lastly, but not least at all, is Dr. Amy Fryer, who is a research associate at the Manitoba Center for Health Policy and is the Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility Lead for the Health Data Research Network. In the context of today's conversation, Amy has been leading an evidence to action group that connects service providers, academics, and people with lived and living experience of methamphetamine use with administrative data analysis interpretation. So welcome, Amy and Carolyn. I will turn it over to you now. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction, Victoria. And thank you so much to the audience for joining us today. And also all of your patience and understanding uh, throughout this time. I'm so glad uh, that we could come back together and that we're gonna talk today about why patient engagement matters in data science, engineering and technology. To start off, um, I would first like to start by acknowledging that myself, Victoria, the Center for Healthcare Innovation are located on the ancestral and current day lands and waters of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Ojibwe Cree, Dakota and Dene Suline people and on the national homeland of the Red River Métis. And in Northern Manitoba, we acknowledge the ancestral lands of the Inuit and gratefully acknowledge that our water is sourced with sh from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. Um, as a white settler on these lands, I feel immense gratitude to Indigenous people who have been the caretakers and who have lived and worked on this land since time immemorial. And in coming together today, we respect the treaties that were made on these lands. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past. We recognize the ongoing present day colonial violence that is faced by Indigenous peoples within healthcare, education, justice, child welfare, and government systems. And we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And definitely when we're talking about patient engagement, it's really important to acknowledge that it is in fact Indigenous research methodologies that are at the forefront and Indigenous scholars, researchers, and communities we should be looking to. And we also believe when we're talking about patient and public engagement, it always has to be grounded within a social justice and health equity lens. Oops. 
So what are we going to talk about today? We're first just going to do a little bit of a touch base on what is patient engagement, what it isn't, uh, why we should engage, some of the levels of engagements and tools and resources that are available. And then we get into the exciting stuff. We have some case studies and examples um, of uh, engagement and action when it comes to data science, technology, and engineering. And because we are accredited by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, I just wanted to dis disclose that myself, Victoria, are employees of the Georgian Fahey Center for Healthcare Innovation. So patient-oriented research, we hear it a lot. Um, and so we look to the strategy for patient-oriented research, which is the national initiative funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. We look to them to see what the definition is. And they define it as a continuum of research that includes, that engages patients as partners. So that means actively involving people with lived experience, family, caregivers, communities in decision-making about the research process. It also focuses on patient-identified priorities. It improves patient outcomes. It's conducted by multidisciplinary teams in partnership with relevant stakeholders. So that could include healthcare professionals, uh, healthcare decision-makers, uh, clinicians, all sorts of all sorts of stakeholders, and then it aims to apply the knowledge generated to improve healthcare systems and practice. So the aim is to move it from research to action. And so you always notice I, I <laughs> capitalize and and bold the and, and that's because it patient oriented patient oriented research encapsulates all, all of these things. And when we talk about patient engagement, it's really about the meaningful and active involvement of patients, people with lived experience, family, caregivers, communities in the governance of research. So that's when we see people with lived experience at all levels of governance in a research project. So the steering committee, the operations committee, uh, sometimes the data safety monitoring board, we have active involvement in all decision-making about the research process. The priority setting of research. So making sure research is actually answering questions that people with lived and living experience think are important to be asking. Uh, the conducting of research, so we do have people with lived and living experience who may be actively involved in, um, in serving participants and in, uh, in uh, interviewing or running focus groups as well as co-researchers and then of course in the interpretation and then the knowledge translation of research. So really uh, including people with lived and living experience and the development of um, policy briefs and the development of different resources, uh, patient decision aids, those types of things that come out, of, come out of research findings. And so really when we say patient engagement, it's research that's carried out with or by members of the public rather than to, about, or for them. It's a great way of kind of phrasing things and that's involved from the UK. And then really people with lived and living experience of a health issue, including patients, informal caregivers, families, friends, and communities having a say in decision-making about the research process. So what patient engagement is not? Sometimes it's, it's easier to kind of get an idea of what something is by looking at what it's not. So patient engagement is not people being recruited as participants. So if you're ever, um, if people with lived experience are, are part, are you, if you're collecting data on them, then they are participants and not partners. It's really about having people involved in decision-making about the research process. So what methods should we be using? What outcomes should we be looking at? Um, what inclusion exclusion criteria should we have? Uh, people completing questionnaires or participating in a focus group as part of the research study, that again would be participants uh, and not partners. 
Um, science festivals open to the public with debates and discussion about research. Awesome and always good to be engaging people around research findings and, and research. But again, that wouldn't be considered patient engagement because it's not a two-way conversation and there's no decision-making involved. An open house at a research center where members of the public are invited to find out about research. Again, awesome. We're engaging people with lived experience. But are, <laughs> we're, we're, have, we're talking to people about research and research findings. But again, it wouldn't be um, as partners in decision-making. Raising awareness of research through media, such as televisions, programs, newspapers, and social media. Um, that wouldn't be because, again, we're missing the two-way conversation and we're missing the idea of shared decision-making. And then finally, sharing research findings with participants, colleagues, or members of the public. So sometimes we call it member checking and research. And that, again, um, is really important to do. Uh, but that would be uh, that wouldn't be considered engagement because they're not partners. Why should I engage? Well, some of the core principles uh, and beliefs that are around engagement are that by engaging people with lived and living experience, um, it will lead to improved health outcomes and an enhanced healthcare system. It will increase the quality and the appropriateness and acceptability and the transparency and relevance of research. And it'll ensure that health research actually addresses issues of importance to people with lived experience of a health condition. And this is a really good um, example that I always like to, or a really good quote that I always like to provide because sometimes when we think of quantitative research, we think of numbers, we think of objectivity, um, we start questioning, well, why do we have to engage people with lived and living experience? And this is a quote from Walter and Anderson um, from a book called Indigenous Statistics, a Quantitative Research Methodology. And I have the information there at the bottom if you want to check out the book because it's amazing. Um, but they write, statistics are powerful persuaders. As systematically collected numerical facts, they do much more than summarize reality in numbers. They also interpret reality and influence the way we understand society. The researchers who create statistics leave their mark on them, not just because people are biased in overt or conscious ways, but also because social, cultural, economic, and political perspectives infuse the research data, even when we think we are just counting people. So this is a really important part to think about. So researchers who create statistics, they're human, and we have our own biases that can inform what we do include and exclude. So we're doing more than just counting people. Um, population statistics create the accepted reality of things most of us think are they're merely describing. And the social, cultural, and economic phenomena that are chosen for inclusion in our research, and also those that are excluded, provide a reflection of a society's changing social, cultural, and economic priorities and norms. And we've had a number of projects where people with lived and living experience have been involved in even the interpretation of quantitative data, of findings, like statistics. And we really start realizing that they tell one story, the findings tell one story, but they don't always tell the whole story. And when we start doing, say, a storytelling methodology, we find out that there's a whole bunch of context around those findings that we would never have really understood or even thought about had we not included people with lived and living experience. So why should I engage? First of all, engaging from the very beginning, people with lived and living experience can help identify research priorities that matter most to them, as well as their informal caregivers and families and communities. We've seen this time and time again. So in rheumatoid arthritis, project, we once saw that um, researchers were convinced that pain management was the way to, was what they needed to look at. 
And when they started to engage people with lived and living experience, they found out, guess what? It's actually fatigue that matters most. And there were more pressing uh, questions around how do I get up and how do I get to work every day? And so by engaging people with lived and living experience, they were able to shift where the, what they were looking at so that it had more meaning for those who are living with the condition. To shape and clarify the research question so that it actually reflects the needs and concerns of people living with a health issue or informal caregivers and families and communities. This happens a lot. We sometimes see that as researchers, we may uh, frame questions in a very deficit kind of way. What's the gap? We want to look at what the problem is. And sometimes when we engage people with lived and living experience, um, we learn that we need to kind of uh, reframe the que research question to perhaps a strengths-based model. So there was an example uh, in a mental health study where it was really, they kept focusing kind of on what is uh, the challenges and moving, how do we move away from mental health issues? And instead, just by reframing the question to how do we move towards well being and reframing the whole study title and the research question, they had way more buy in and way more people were interested in the project as well. To help ensure the research methods that are being proposed for the study are appropriate and accessible, acceptable and sensitive to the very real world context in which people with lived experience live, work, and play. So we've seen in data science where people have informed kind of the inclusion, exclusion, what they really think is important about the cohort. It's all, um, it's quite amazing how that happens. And then when we think about um, other types of interventions, uh, we've had studies where we had a chronic pain study where they had this initial survey tool uh, that just, um, once they started to engage people with lived and living experience, it just wasn't working. Um, and so they redesigned it to be uh, self-paced and um, and self-reported self and it changed the number of people who wanted to participate and the amount of data that was collected. To help ensure researchers use outcomes that have true meaning to uh, the lives of patients and caregivers and families and communities. We've seen that we had a clinical trial where we were using patient reported outcome measures and surveys and to follow up on an intervention. And what we realized um, was that they, one of the biggest pressing questions that, that weighed on them when they were making decisions was around care, the amount of time a caregiver would have to take off. And so in that way, um, they were able to add a whole other survey uh, around caregiver burden that actually brought up outcomes that would be very important when it came to decision making around surgery. So just by engaging people with lived experience around outcomes that are that matter to them, it really changed the direction. Helping ensure the language and the content of the information that you're providing to participants in studies. So questionnaires, patient participant pamphlets uh, that they're appropriate and accessible, that we're using language that isn't stigmatizing, that we're, that we're giving the information that's required. It's so important to have people with lived experience engaged. And then to help increase participation in research studies by making sure the research is appropriate and acceptable to potential partner participants. Uh, improving the information provided so people can make informed decisions, and then helping to include voices traditionally less heard in research as well. To conduct data collection, so some of our some of our projects, um, we've had people with lived and living experience actively uh, involved as co-researchers. So perhaps. Uh, facilitating interviews, uh, focus groups, uh, delivering surveys, uh, and finding that it provided more in-depth um, discovery because people felt more comfortable around someone who had gone through the same experience. 
And then the interpretation of research findings from the perspective of people with lived and living experience and informing recommendations. We've seen this time and time again, where so oftentimes how we look at findings, um, we may miss a lot of uh, a lot of the context in which they exist. And so including people with lived and living experience in the interpretation, we get more of that context. Um, and see this, the real story behind the numbers. Uh, informing recommendations, having people involved in say clinical practice guidelines and that development uh, recommendations for policy at the end too and knowledge translation is so important. So also to help co-develop ways to share and implement research findings with patients and informal caregivers and communities. We've had partners help co-develop um, decision aids, we've had people with lived and living experience co-develop uh, evidence-based op-eds for mainstream media. So finding ways to um, develop uh, KT products as well. And then to identify a wider set of research topics or new areas of research. Um, so many people, so many researchers that we work with after they've begun to engage, realize there's a whole area of research that they can shift to, uh, mainly because of all the ideas that come from people with lived and living experience and areas that they hadn't thought about exploring before. And then to make, of course, to help ensure research reflects the concerns and the interests and the values of the public and that money and resources are being used efficiently. Um, that's always kind of one of those overriding ones as well. Another reason is that we are seeing more and more in grants and funding and in publishing um, a, a, a push for engagement of people with lived and living experience. So if you're applying to a Canadian Institute of Health Research grant or a SPORE grant, you may see um, requirements around wanting to have a patient partner uh, involved, have, having an engagement strategy uh, included. We know that different journals, BMJ, CMAJ, um, now ask about uh, whether you've engaged people with lived and living experience when you submit a manuscript. And CMAJ actually has a whole collection devoted to patient-oriented research now. Um, there's also uh, there's also manu there's also uh, journals like BMC research involvement and engagement that is dedicated to engagement. So there's a lot of opportunities to not only publish about your research findings, but also to publish about um, the engagement strategy you used, what the impact of engaging people with lived and living experience in your work as well. And of course, it can inform the limitations of your work as we were talking about and what we what can't be measured as well. So those aspects that you can include. And then what you'll hear a lot when we talk about engagement is levels of engagement. So at the lower end, we talk about the consultation level and that's when we engage people with lived and living experience in decision-making, but um, say you're, you're just getting feedback and input uh, about the research process, but the decision-making still uh, stays with the researcher. At the collaboration level, that's when you're actively partnering, partnering with people with lived experience in every decision about the research process and you have a shared decision-making model. So you're using participatory approaches that allow for shared decision-making. And then at the patient and public directed, uh, or community-based, uh, we see uh, people with lived and living experience or communities actively controlling, directing, and managing the research pro process. So then they are giving directions to the researcher and, and um, involving the researcher because of their expertise, but the researcher is carrying out the research under the direction of community members or people with lived experience. And of course, depending on the level of engagement that you look at, you, there are many different participatory approaches that you can use, and we've got some resources that can help with that. So tools and resources, we have a patient and public engagement team here at CHI, and we're missing a few people here, but we have Dr. Kate Sibley, we have Ogai Scherzoy, um, and we also have Mary Ann Normie. Um, 
and myself there, but we're we're always available for questions and you can always come to us. We have a monthly lunchtime learning series uh, so, such as this. Um, you can access previous session recordings at that link and you can sign up for a newsletter to hear about the upcoming sessions as well. We offer free one hour consults so we can get together and talk about um, your thoughts around patient engagement, help develop a, a strategy uh, together, give some guidance and advice around it. And we do have some fee base. So if you're looking for facilitation and those types of things as well, and there's an intake form you can, you can fill out and, um, and we can meet up and talk about engagement. Knowledge Nudge is a blog that we have with over 30 posts around engagement. Uh, and that's a great little resource as well. And then we have online resources available. We have a guide to methods in patient engagement. We have a, um, which actually maps the entire research process, every decision, and then what level of engagement. And then it gives you some suggestions on participatory approaches. We have a budget builder, so it's an Excel spreadsheet that helps you develop a comprehensive budget that you can attach to your grant proposal, a readiness to engage workbook that you can work with your research team as well as patient partners um, getting when you're at that stage where you're just starting to think about engagement. We have a low cost and free counseling list for, Man for our Manitoba folks. And this is a great list to have on hand should you be engaging and someone needs some extra supports. We also have a recruitment guide and they're all found at that link below. And we'll share this. I am now going to hand it over to our lovely, uh, I think it's to Victoria next to talk a little bit about. And Victoria, did you want to use your PowerPoints? Yes, please. There we go. Just take a minute to share. All righty. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, so I'll take a bit of time to talk about examples in engineering and technology, and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Amy Fryer for her uh, work in engagement in data science. Uh, so starting off with the engineering example, I have an example from the Child Prosthetics Research Project coming out of England. And so in this project, they aim to establish a collaboration group with key stakeholders to aid the design of activity prosthetic limbs for children. So these include things like running blades or swim limbs. The stakeholders they identified to engage here were children and their caregivers, the leaders from healthcare teams, academia, as well as industry and those involved in implementing those designs. They first started off by conducting a needs assessment of what needs to be looked at and everyone's perspectives. And this was really adapted closer to each of the stakeholders' um, time and resources available. And so folks like clinicians, they engaged via an online survey, just a quick and easy way to get their perspective and not take up more than needed of their busy time already. But with children, they took a bit more of a creative approach and also made it more creative workshops for them to actually um, contribute to their perspectives. And so they had workshops and paper-based questionnaires for them, but they really focused on drawing and self-expression and to get to their needs assessments uh, contributed to this project. So here's an example of some of the work they were doing. And so they would have the children with their caregivers come to a space, for example, and really focus on drawing and kind of things like thought bubbles of things that they might want to contribute of what they think about on a regular basis when they are the ones who are to be wearing these prosthetic limbs. And also putting things into context of, for example, them being a superhero and what kind of needs would they have of their prosthetic limb if they were a superhero themselves and needed some supports in that sense. In the second part of this, they brought all the stakeholder groups together to form their StarWorks project. And so for this portion, they each had of the stakeholder groups come up and present their problem definition. So really focusing on their perspective of what their challenges are and what their needs are. So even though they communicated all of this within their own 
portions of the needs assessment. This was really bringing everybody together and getting everyone on the same page. And then they worked on forming ideas together. And so for children and everyone else that was uh, taking turn in this, they actually presented this blank sheet of paper, which had a really empty big space for drawing the design of prosthetic limbs, but not leaving them too astray. They would include some prompts of things to consider that are critical when designing a prosthetic limb. So asking folks to think about things like what it might be made out of, when and what sort of activities it would be used for, how long will it probably last, and things like that to kind of aid in that design. Out of this project, what they ended up finding is they've found 59 problem areas or themes that they uh, were get grouped together at the end. And 15 of these were actually never considered before in the design of such prosthetic limbs. And so, for example, one of the most critical pieces identified by children in the, them being the ones who have to wear them was that they wanted more independence to have to put it on and off without the assistance of an adult. And so this has been a critical piece to them, but it was never actually addressed in the way that they have been living their lives. And lastly, they were also given an opportunity to continue their involvement. So just because they were in that initial design and formation, they also wanted to continue having them in, uh, be with them. So they, asking them which project they specifically resonated with the most and the designs they liked the most, and also giving them the opportunity to be flexible in how they might want to be contacted. So be it phone, email, or in person, et cetera and also asking more critically of what level of engagement they'd want to continue on with. Did they want to be fully involved and in participating in the active design of these uh, prosthetic limbs? Did they want to be contacted for advice or did they want to just receive updates of how things were going as the designs progressed? And maybe then they would decide whether they wanted to be more involved or not. The other example is for technology, and in this one, it is a digital therapy tool for mental health in adolescents. And so the goal of this project was to engage youth to understand what their preferences were for seeking online mental health resources before going on to also co-design those resources with them. And the key stakeholders identified here were the school health counselors, the community youth themselves, but also their extended families. So in this beginning of the engagement, they were all given a tablet with all mental health apps and websites that are currently in existence. And they were asked to reflect on the following portions as they were interacting with these resources. They were asked to look at what their current behaviors and needs were and whether those existing resources actually met those needs. They also looked at what their preference for the delivery of the information was. Is it an app? Is it a website or things like that? They also asked for to reflect on the content delivery itself. Do we want it to be in text form? Is it a video that's better? Or is it even a game that might be more appropriate? And lastly, also looking to reflect on what kind of feedback they were receiving, as how they were making progress interacting with these resources, so was there like writing prompts and was there, for example, an AI that could interact back and uh, give them feedback on what they were writing? They then took uh, all of this and came together to lead some discussions. They did some sketching ideas, telling stories and creating wall storms. So where they write ideas on sticky notes, so you post them on the wall and kind of interact and move those around and discuss where things fit together. What they found together at the end is that there's kind of a taxonomy of how adolescent and youth actually engage with digital mental health tools. And so it really is a spectrum that matters on their age. So they're being either a lot younger or a bit older in the teenage years, but also whether they were at the time experiencing stress or low mood or whether they were not. And so, for example, a child who is much younger and is not currently experiencing stress or low mood might actually more prefer interactive games to learn about such uh, experiences and resources to help them in the future. 
but someone who is a bit older and maybe is currently experiencing stress or low mood, for example, they kind of wanted more straight to the point. They want to learn what they can do and then they want to move on with their day and imply, actually apply those skills and resources they learned about. And then there's, of course, the different other um, spectrums of those that are younger but are experiencing a stress or low mood will want to be a bit more engaged with the resources and the learning opportunities. And on the other hand, uh, children that are a bit older and are not experiencing stress or low mood might be a little bit more spectacle and might need a bit more convincing that these resources are needed, for example. And one of the wonderful things that have already come out of this engagement opportunity is they have created a game that is co-designed with the youth and it is based on cognitive behavioral therapy. And so they can work through this and get a bit of instructions on how to practice these things, but also um, be a bit more interactive. And now I will turn it over to Amy for her work in data science. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to talk very briefly about um, a project I've been co-leading through the Manitoba Center for Health Policy with the help of Carolyn Shimon and Ogai Scherzwa, who are here today. Um, and our study is about methamphetamine use in Manitoba. And really, we're looking at um, an administrative data study that engages people with lived and living experience. Um, and this study stemmed from some provincial, uh, fun provincially funded research that happened uh, right in 2019 and 2020, uh, which looked at the prevalence of meth use in Manitoba um, and other defining characteristics using administrative data, which saw um, a 700% increase um, that documented meth use uh, through Winnipeg Fire and Paramedic Service data um, or largely emergency room data. And so stemming from this, an application was made to uh, Health Canada, um, which funded a continuation of this project with uh, the knowledge that there would be an evidence to action or collaborative um, component of this study. And so we really have kind of three areas that complement each other with this study. Um, one, looking at the analysis of administrative data. Um, the other, an evidence to action group that uh, is really key and central in defining what we were looking at and the analysis and ultimately knowledge translation, um, and then an evaluation component of this. Our group uh, really has been brought together with the goal to engage public rights holders, service providers, and knowledge users in the research to ensure that their firsthand knowledge and perspectives are really represented in the research process, reflected in the interpretation of results, um, and ultimately driving the analysis uh, to address critical issues that they identify in a culturally sensitive way. And so on the right here, there's um, some of our members, um, and I'll just let you read that. And so I would say our first meetings really emphasized visioning and goal setting. Uh, we had some conversation about what trauma-informed um, and culturally sensitive ways to, to approach uh, methamphetamine use research um, would be. And so I would say that this is really key to the process because you need to take some time to build trusting relationships um, and cultivate that sense of is this a truly safe space? And we were doing this in the context of the pandemic. And so there are some additional challenges, but especially recognizing that in our context, methamphetamine use in Manitoba is so intertwined uh, with histories of colonization, racism, um, and other components that are driven by systems built during uh, colonial times. Um, and so we've had a couple outputs from that. We have a guiding principles for working together and a vision st statement that really helps ground us as we've gone through the process now over the last four years. We spent some time uh, building capacity with this group around what is administrative data and how can people who might not be um, 
Well, I wouldn't say well-versed because I think people do have a general understanding, but people who might be coming to administrative data from different capacities, people have like some understanding that administrative data is collected when they visit a doctor or hospital, but really most people don't know where that information goes or who gets a hold of it um, and what can actually be done with it. And so we spent some time really layering uh, that capacity um, and working with from where people were uh, coming to it with this project, which were very varied. <laughs> uh, I would say that some people were coming as academics or clinicians, and some people were coming as people with lived and living experience to this project. Um, and so this built us towards a themed interpretation of some of our data. Um, and this is just one example where I will say, I think we learned a lot from this. The first time we presented this data um, about the prevalence of mental health distor disorders in our study population, we used the traditional bar graphs, um, which does show quite a uh, glaring difference in the rate of mental health disorders, but it was not sensitive to uh, the group that we were working with. And so we did some work to um, make sure that the next time we brought this information back to our E2A group, it was presented in a much more culturally sensitive and safe way and that people weren't just looking at a bar graph that might depict something very pertinent to their own life and experience. Um, and so some of that had to do with the way we presented information um, and having people really involved in that uh, presentation <laughs> rather than just saying, oh, the, this is how we normally do it. So this is how it's gonna be. Um, and Carolyn talked about uh, using people's stories to kind of complement um, data analysis and what we do in interpretation. And this is just one example where the data was telling one story and the people who came to this group um, were really emphasizing um, missing pieces to this story. So one person said that what is striking is that a lot of individuals who use meth had contact with the healthcare system, which would have been uh, which would have been opportunities to intervene and help. This means that people are not being connected to the right help. Um, and so this was really key in our interpretation of the data that we had gotten. I'll very quickly say that along the way, we've learned a lot of lessons. Uh, this is the first time for our research group uh, using an E2A approach uh, with administrative data. And so it was really about adapting public engagement strategies for administrative data and not, you know, one size doesn't fit all and you can't just use one technique and kind of place it on the administrative data output and think that it's going to work. Um, we've had a lot of expectations and a lot of different uh, things that people wanted to get out of this group and managing that was hard. We had COVID-19. And finally, we've had some challenges even just institutionally with ethics and valuing lived um, experience in a research project. Um, the people that we have as part of this group, they are not, we are not studying them. They are research co-creators, um, not research uh, subjects. So that was something that really took a long time to get um, people to understand within that sense. And also just as a reflection that we've, I think gone between um, different parts of the spectrum through the projects. There's been times, uh, whether based off of resources or energy, especially during the pandemic, that this group was more informing what we were doing. Um, but now we've kind of tried to move to the model of involving or collaborating um, and we hope to get more funding in the future so that uh, the we can get to that kind of empowering piece where the the people with lived and living experience have a high level of power and decision making um, emphasis in this project, and they are the ones actually leading the work. So that was a very brief um, overview, but happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, did we, before discussion questions, Victoria, did we want to just um, talk about the prep award? Is that? For sure. We'll just put that in now and then we'll stop the recording for the question period.
Okay, so just a quick note. There we go. So a quick note on our prep award, preparing for research by engaging people and people uh, lived experience. <laughs> it's actually <laughs> um, preparing for research by engaging uh, patient and public partners. So prep, uh, we have an award that just launched March 1st. Uh, the deadline is April 1st. And this is really, we're looking at engaging people with lived and living experience at the very early stages of research at the priority setting phase, the research question, um, and the design and, and developing a larger grant. Uh, and we have a specific one, um, the Dr. Wadaman Srisa Kuldi Memorial Prep Award. Um, and so this one is, we are specifically looking for people who are thinking about uh, doing engagement in technology, engineering, uh, or data science to, to apply. And there is an information session uh, later on, on Friday, I think, over the noon hour, uh, for those who would like to register for that as well. Um, but just a, a call out to this, this award. Is there one more? Oh, that's the discussion piece. But I think we can take that down, right? Stop sharing and open it up. Well, I will stop the recording and I will bring back the participant ability to unmute and video. 